this is, this is, this is. Where are you at? Where are you, where are you calling from? Uh, I'm in West Seattle. West Seattle, no. Yeah. Well, I was just looking at your, like, your house. Are you oh, at your house? Oh. Or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is uh, one of our pinball machines in the background here. This is just like the side room in our house right now. Me and my wife are big pinball nerds. Dude, I love pinball. So tell me about, like, so why did you get into pinball? Because I, I used to have a pinball machine in my studio for years. Nice. Nice. Which one was it? It was Oklahoma. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, it was like the old <laughs> musical Oklahoma. Yes. And, and it was school. great, but it just got super old, and then at one point it stopped working, and I think it was possessed. So like all of these things, I was like, you know, I, I need some more space in here anyway. So yeah, I get that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so we bought this one, but we also bought it. Uh, like this is from 1979. It's a Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It's the the first uh, time that a pinball company did a deal with a, a movie company. So it actually says Columbia Cinema like right on the bottom. Wow. Um, but me and my wife bought this one, kind of broken to work on it, and we fixed it and rehabilitated it, so it's good to go. Yeah, I got into pinball, like, I mean, I've always kind of played on the road, you know, because there's, like, pinball machines around. But uh, a couple years ago, I got a buddy who got me really into it, and uh, he he was, he was had passed away, which sucked. And when he uh, when he passed, I kind of got into it to kind of reconnect with him. And then I got stupid into it, like, crazy into it. Now I play on a league that plays every Monday, just like a bowling league. I play on a pinball league here in Seattle, and I go, I, like, compete and stuff. What is yeah, that like? Fun. Do you have do you have to go to practices? What's the situation like competing? No, pinball? no, you practice you practice on your own. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, because it's also a bunch of loners. It's like a very kind of punk rock world. Yeah. Because they, I mean, I, I I would hesitate to say they consider themselves a sport, but I mean, it's all over Twitch, like, and like the huge competitions are worldwide and streamed all over the world all the time. So. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, nothing shocks me for one, but especially with video gaming being like insanely popular and and now yeah. you can be a millionaire and be like i'm a professional gamer you're like what do you play yep. uh call of duty or whatever you know yeah. Fortnite. Yeah. <laughs> well and the uh like what's crazy to think about is that for years it's been like like when i first started playing pinball i thought everybody i was going to play against was going to look like my dad he's from enumclaw like mustache white reeboks dad jeans you know but it's <laughs> it's a lot of younger kids these days and actually the guys who just won I'm not sure if it's national, but there was a huge tournament recently. And the guys who won, like, in the finals were, like, 17, 18, 19 years old. So the kids are the kids are picking it up again, man, yeah. which kind of bums me out as an old guy. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> You're like, there's got to be one thing I can do better than a kid. <laughs> yeah, Should yeah. be pinball. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Those hand, that hand-eye coordination. I mean, it, it, is there, like, I hate to get nerdy with this shit, but, like, I kind of want to know, like, as a novice, just somebody that's always enjoyed playing pinball like yourself, like kind of like in the bars and you're sitting around yeah. having a beer. But what's the – like how do you get good at pinball? Is it just literally just spend time doing it? Or is yeah, there, is yeah. there well, any tricks? So is there... <laughs> there's absolutely tricks. And there's absolutely yeah. – well, it's honestly – it's like playing guitar or bass, right? It's like okay. you learn the basics in the beginning and you get used to it and you get your groundwork, right? And you get okay. But if you want to take that next step, you have to learn the intricacies of playing. And it's the, very much the same thing. Is that kind of like uh, learning why, how you can get like, okay, let's rack up this, this combos and things like that. Like, is it, is it, is each game so different or is there like things about a certain pinball machine that's always the same that you can use the same techniques on so that, I mean, that, That's a great question. So there's a couple like techniques you can use with flipper buttons and nudging, you know, where you can move the machine without tilting it that you have to learn that you can apply to any game you play, but every single game has different rules. So I read rule sets all the time. Like before I go to bed as a hobby, I'll like pick a game I've never played and I'll read the rules. So that way when I step up to it, I know. Yeah. It's, I mean, I'm, I'm obsessed. dude. (laughs) Okay. Dude, I love that. So when you go to, when you have a tournament say, or, or, Maybe even just like a, a regular night, maybe it's not as big of a deal. But like if you're going to a tournament, do you have a list of all the games that are there for you to play? Yeah. Or is it random? Like you don't know, like pop quiz. So there's there's an app called Pin Map that has every single city and all the pinball machines in the city. So like when we go on tour, the band all plays pinball. So we'll go, all right, we gotta load in the venue at this time, but then we have this much time. Where's the closest place with a lot of machines? And we can look up a bar in that city and see every single game it has there. And so 
when you play a tournament, you know all of the games. So the best strategy is to kind of know all of them a little bit. But, I mean, if you can know every game, obviously you're going to have one up on somebody. But that's also a lot of – I mean, there's thousands of games. So, you know, it's tough. But, I mean, it's at this point, it's it's such a – it's such an intense hobby for me that I don't mind learning. I actually really love it. When we're on the road, we're in the van. I literally reading rule sets and the guys will like ask me questions, you know, it used to be star Wars trivia. Now it's pinball rule sets. So. <laughs> it's like MMA. Like certain fighters have a, a style of this style or a different style. And sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. And yeah. you could be a very cerebral, cerebral player, or you could be just like, I'm a mechanical player. I don't know what the terms are. Are, are there terms yeah. for that kind of like different kinds of players? Absolutely. Yeah. So there's, um, there's control playing, which is what I try to do, which is where your first goal after you plunge the ball is to stop it on a flipper and then pick your shots and get control, pick your shot. And then there's flow players, which is just like kind of my dad's era of playing, which is when the ball is coming towards the flipper, you flip and you hope for the best. And so I think there's, uh, I mean, there is different players out there that kind of combine those things, but it is it is very much like you described there with MMA to where it's like I'll see somebody and I'll know their style when they're playing. And sometimes you can use that against them too, which is really nice. Like you can pick a machine that you know they'll have to play you on that sucks for that style. And so there's, <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, little bit, there's a lot of competition to it. It's, it's a cool world to be in, man. It's a lot of fun. That's interesting. I wonder if it's <laughs> like that at all for punk rock and, and street punk and like just the genre <laughs> of punk rock. But – it doesn't feel like that to me because I've just been part of it for so long that it's not like it's a hobby, I guess, punk rock and music, but like, it's also <laughs> yeah. my life. It's everything I do. But, <laughs> but like, yeah, it, there is something about learning something new that makes you, makes you go to a different level with it. Maybe a different yeah, ab- nerd absolutely. level or I don't know, knowledge level, but. Absolutely. And you know, I, uh, I hate to call back to, I think like 25 years ago, but I remember victory did a documentary that you were on. Um, I was on, I had it on VHS when I was a kid. I wish I could remember the name of it. It was one word that started with an R and victory records did it. Uh, but so you had a quote on there where you said, are you punk rock because you love it? I might be misquoting you. Or are you punk rock? Cause no one likes you. And I always thought that was a really incredible point that you made back in the day, because the pinball world is very similar. It's a bunch of like outsiders who found this community because they didn't fit that in a lot like punk rock. They didn't yeah. fit in anywhere. And so, but they were like, well, I like to play pinball in a bar and they're still being social, but they don't have to talk to anyone because no one talks to you while you're playing. They don't want to mess up your game. So it is this really beautiful kind of like another outsider community I happen to find that I now fucking love. And it's like a huge hobby for me. And now to, to the point to where my wife and I are like learning to restore machines and like hopefully open our own arcade one day. Amazing. Yeah. Let me know when it's <laughs> open. I'll come by. Yeah, well, you can come play this one anytime, too. <laughs> right on, right on. That's awesome. Well, let's tell tell everybody, you know, what's up with the the drowns, and yeah. you know, you know, I know you from Success, you know, Seattle mm-hmm. punk band, many years, but um, now your new thing has been going for a while, and uh, mm-hmm. you got a couple albums, a couple EPs, a bunch of singles, like, so yeah. what? So what's been going on with the drowns? Tell me about it. So uh, Success was going for about fifteen years, and. When that started to teeter off, we're all still friends. We all still might do something one day, but, you know, jobs and kids and life happened. And uh, Andy and I from that band wanted to keep going, so we started the Drowns, and we wanted to push more of the music that we loved. A lot. Like, we're both huge Cox Bar fans and mm. Stiff Little Fingers, and really wanted to aim that way. And so uh, we started the Drowns, and, I mean, it's been going crazy for five years now. We, we're still putting out records on Pirates Press, we couldn't be happier. That's like the funnest label to be on and everybody's great. And uh, yeah, man, we're just, we're so motivated. We took all the lessons we learned from success and like applied them to this. And I think that's how we were able to kind of pick up some momentum so quick. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it sounds good. Like uh, the new record, sound, the, the latest record anyway, sounds great. Um, and I'm just wondering like, what is it like for you to be playing guitar? Cause you just sang in success, right? You were just the, the, the lead guy. No, I played guitar too. Did you play yeah, guitar, guitar too? too? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I would I would swap out sometimes though. Okay. So. Maybe a lot of for some reason I just remember seeing you maybe one time just singing or something, mm. but I could be yeah. wrong. Yeah. Memories are crazy. Uh, so yeah, I was gonna ask like, but that you know going to a three piece, how has that been? Because I I dig the three piece. I was surprised actually. 
listening to you and then checking out a video and seeing that you were a three piece, I was like, oh wow, this sounds, you know, like this is cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we started as a three piece. Uh, we have we added another guitar player. Now. Okay, okay. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> hey, so did MXPX. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, no, it's it's it was cool, man. W to be honest, when we started this project, it was more. It wasn't even like we need to start a band. It wasn't even like that thought process. It was like we need to start a band that has an understanding that a lot of bands don't have. So we went straight into it before even really talking about the music. We were talking about work ethic right out of the gate. We were like, I'm going to say yes to well, I was like, I'm going to say yes to every single opportunity. And if the two of you can't do something, then this isn't going to work out. And so the idea straight out of the gate was just say yes to everything and write nonstop. That's why we've recorded so much already like we actually have backlogged material coming out through the end of the year and in the next year and we're recording another record in november that probably won't even come out for like to like 2024 or something and that's kind of been the thought process here it's more been an exercise in hard work than it has been in a band as weird as that sounds it's yeah. like we just haven't stopped and uh we we came to that understanding as a three-piece which is really nice so when we, when we recently brought this other guy in too it was the same thing. So I was like, his name's Johnny. And I was like, Johnny, if you can't do anything, then this isn't going to work out. Right. So everybody has the same understanding, which I think is pretty, it's not usual in the music world. It's like, everybody has their own focus and aim. And, you know, obviously we all have lives, you know, everybody has things going on, but how do you, we were so committed that we just said, you know, screw it. <laughs> yeah. No, I'd love to know, like, how do you actually get it done? Like what's some of the, maybe the routines that you get into over the over months and months of like writing, practicing, figuring out, okay, now we have enough songs. Do we, do you talk to the label and then get in the studio? Like what, are, what is that looking like amidst your daily lives, you know, and, and probably working and doing other things and with family. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So we all, we all work, uh, you know, normal jobs. The, the routine for me personally is I just write constantly like every night and even like last night i was laying in bed i couldn't sleep we have a new puppy and he's like not sleeping well <laughs> uh so he, he woke me up and uh last night i was just like had something going on in my head and i wrote lyrics down that i'll probably never use but it's just constantly exercising that muscle for me so uh i mean i'm writing all the time so i always have material ready to go and we practice once sometimes twice a week and usually that practice is working on the old stuff whatever tour set list we have coming up but then we always write. So almost every practice, we're also throwing in a new one or a couple of new ones and, you know, just kind of seeing if they work out. And then we get in the studio. We worked with Ted Hutt twice in L.A. And so uh, then, you know, that's a whole nother step. It's like we write all the material. We tell the label we're ready to go. Um, we set up the recording. But then we show up with Ted Hutt and we completely rearrange all the stuff we worked on. You know, yep. producer gets in there and does this magic. And he's great. And I, I love the guy. But he definitely like it's one of those things I've gotten used to, to where it's like do a bunch of prep just to get it completely shifted shift around. So. Right, right, right. And that's as a songwriter. And I've gone through that plenty and, and recently yeah. as well. And you think, OK, well, can't I just like write the song better in the first place? So it's like ready to go. But for some <laughs> reason, there's just like that process of of, you know, going through that that little grinder of, you know, a few a few collaborators, I guess you could say. Yeah. It, it does change it. And I guess as long as it changes it for the better, right? Like then yeah. you kind of you kind of need that process, even if you change it, you know, that that first process where you're doing it with your guys and you're like, okay, it's ready to go. Let's record it exactly like this. I love it. And mm -hmm. then some you know, having that outside perspective obviously can be bad too. You know, it's just you have to have <laughs> yeah. the right <laughs> the right yeah. person. I mean, yeah. No, it's for sure a balance, dude. And I, I yeah. know that you know what I'm talking about because it's like you go in there. It, it's really – it's a uh, it's an exercise in ego is what it is. Like I go in there and I really want what I wrote to be exactly what it is, you know. And then I have somebody else tell me either it sucks or it needs to get switched around or that I'm wrong about something. And really it's an exercise in ego. And it's allowing yourself to collaborate, in my opinion, that truly makes that material good. It's like putting those minds together. And then I think in a lot of, at least in my own music, when I'm, when I have that conflict inside of me of this producer that I'm working with, it usually makes me write something better. Mm -hmm. So inevitably the end product comes out great. So like, like the, the most recent 
um, the we have an EP that's coming out soon, uh, May sixth, and we we did that with Ted, and I brought in a song that was incredibly near and dear to my heart, and the subject matter was incredibly important to me, but it didn't flow with Ted, and it was like for me it was the one. I was like, this is the one that's that's you know, I worked so hard on, mm -hmm. and Ted, uh, he kind of you know put his two cents in and it broke me down a little bit, you know, it broke me down a little bit to, to like ha take a hit like that. But then out of that, we used the music. I rewrote lyrics and rewrote the song and it's like one of the things I'm most proud of that I've ever done. So, yeah. and it, it was that little bit of vulnerability that he created that allowed me to do that. And that sucks, but it also, it rules, you know, it's like... it sucks. <laughs> it, it just goes back to the idea that, you know, most things that are important, most things that are worth doing are going to cause, there's going to be something you got to pay for, like whether it's like your, mm. your, you know, uncomfortable situation, you know, ego, whatever. But, yeah. um, but breaking it down, you know, from like being produced as a, as a songwriter, as a band, as a musician, it's similar to authors. You know, if you think of the best novels you've, you've ever read, those mm -hmm. all have editors. Those all have people Absolutely. that are going, nah, this is, you fix that, fix this, <laughs> nah, what are yeah. you talking about? This makes no sense. And I'm yeah. sure different editors are, are, some are nice, some are brutal. I'm sure there's a, a spectrum. <laughs> well, but, Lord knows there's producers like that. So. Yes, exactly. <laughs> some, some guys just, they don't spare your feelings at all. Um, yeah. but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's needed. It's not needed mm -hmm. for necessarily everybody. Maybe there's an author out there that writes and checks their own work and it's like, that's perfect done. But most mm -hmm. people need somebody else to go, this doesn't make sense here, but it could work if you cut it down and put it here, you know, like, and the same things kind of happen with songs where, like you said, you know, you write something that you're super proud of, you think connects to you, and then you realize mm -hmm. you didn't communicate it to somebody listening in the way you thought you did. Absolutely. And that that is rough on the ego for me, but like, yeah. <laughs> but it's that's usually what it is for songwriting for me is is some lyric doesn't make sense, and to me it makes sense because I get some like weird idea in my head, mm -hmm. and I'm like, yeah, that's clever. All right, you know, like this is what I mean. But like, if somebody just hears it. They don't. Know, yeah. They don't know that in my head. It's like a completely totally. foreign, foreign thing. So I try to remember that. You know, and I still, I still do. You know, write lyrics that need fixing all the time. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, for me too. It's like I, I also, like I said, I write constantly, and so it, it's good to exercise that muscle. But also, you know, some bullshit slips through, and so it's like, you know, I need someone to pick that out. I, I, I've learned that, and it was hard for me to learn. You know, but I, I, I need someone to kind of pick out and let me know how it connects to them. And that way it's almost, yeah, it's like, like you said, like an author, it's like having just proofreading. It's like mm -hmm. having someone proofread your work and yeah, I love it. And Ted's been, he's been great. This just tiny little British man is just super sweet guy, <laughs> but, awesome. but also can be this guy who glaze into me. So it's this nice dichotomy. I still like him at the end of the day. So, so we, we're doing good. Yeah. That's always been. That's always been inter an interesting part of my experience recording with producers is the singing. Usually it's singing because when I'm playing bass, it's like, you know, whatever, you know, just do it again if I screw up. But with singing, it's uh, so personal. It's like your lyrics and it's your voice. And if you don't do the right thing, <laughs> you know, they're telling <laughs> yeah. you like you're doing it over and over. You're like, do it over, do it over, do it over there's been times where I've been like, I swear I'm doing it right. Like I'm doing the exact, yeah. the, I'm doing exactly what you're asking me to do. But then funny thing is you go and listen to it and you're like, Oh, I hear it differently now that I'm not singing it. And so yeah. it's just a learning process and it breaks down your ego. It breaks down, you know, that, that whatever that is that, <laughs> that makes you resist change and resist um, letting go of some of those ideas. But, I love that you, you write so much. Like, do you, the, I mean, obviously maybe it's part momentum. Like when you get in that mindset of writing all the time, just mm -hmm. keep that going. Right. Like, is there, is yeah. there, it, does it ever end? Like, is it, is it just a constant in your life for the most part? Like yeah, every so few days it, you just put something pops up. Absolutely. And I, I think I have anxiety around losing things. So it's like if I have a concept or an idea in my head, I immediately have to get it down. And it, it gives me anxiety if I can't, you know, yeah. like 
there's my wife she's so sweet but i have stopped her mid conversation and been like i need you to stop talking give me two seconds and write something down because i i have this horrible fear that i'm going to lose a great concept one day absolutely um, yeah and and you know we're we're both getting older it's like you know I, I can't imagine that I'm going to be able to hold on to everything as well as I did in my twenties, you know? So I, I'm really trying to, if I have something that I, I my if it's enough to spark my interest in my mind, I have to get it down. I'm like, okay, well maybe I'll throw this away later, but I have to get it out right now. So, and I think that that manifests itself in my day to day to where like, now it's just routine to where yeah. like, if I think, if I think of something cool, I'm immediately going to jot it down. And you know, in riffs too, same thing. Like, you know, we're so fortunate to have phones where we can immediately record something. And so I'll just grab a guitar, grab the keys and just immediately throw something down real quick just so I have the riff in there. Yeah. And I don't lose it. You know? I mean, a lot of times I'll just. <laughs> All right. Type that in. You know. Yeah. If, if, yeah. If you can hear my voice memos, it's so much of that. It would be so embarrassing for someone to hear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was hanging out with Tim Armstrong one time. He was up in my studio in Bremerton and he was like check this out man he's like i i carry this around wherever i go and he just carries around this little notebook and so he'll write down ideas and this was this was like right before iphones were a thing it was like i think i had a sidekick at the time or something (laughs) oh yeah yeah yeah. so like that and and i did i started writing in journals like i was like i'll take that piece so i that's one thing i i learned from tim armstrong that that i've taken with me till now but now we have cell phones so I still have journals, but I use mm-hmm. them less for songs and more for writing down what happened, writing down what's, yeah. what my thoughts are or whatever. But, like, I love the fact that we can just go into our notes, and I'll do this. I'll just write down a song title. I'll write down a line of a song and then just go on about my day, and I'll come back to it later. Yeah, and, you know, now having worked with producers so much and so many different producers, I'll actually – I've learned to, uh, like, front load lyrics, too. So if like there's things that I'm questionable on, I'll write alternative lines or alternative verses, or I'll write multiple more verses than I normally would have just to have that later on if something doesn't work out. I uh, When we worked with Ted, Ted also did the Gaslight Anthem stuff. And he told me something when we first worked with him that Brian had a book of like tons of lines and like he he would have them kind of like sectioned out for like whether it's like emotional themes or like whatever he needed. And then he could draw from this book of lines he had written. And that stuck with me. I was like, that's a pretty cool and smart idea. You know, if it's just one line or two and it's not changing the whole concept of the song, it's smart to have that like backup of great little lines you've written. So I do the same thing these days. I think it's it's super smart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's heavily organized for Brian to do that. Like I, I, <laughs> I do that kind of like where I have lines, you know, written down, but it's just so random. It's like, Nowadays it's by date, you know, I'll have like one thing, but it'll each, it'll be a line and then the next one will be a date and then a line or a few lines depending on what I wrote. But having like moods and like yeah, a love line, a confused one, angry, yeah, exactly. yeah. that's a I lot mean, of organization. I, dude, well, I mean, I bet in the moment though, I bet that makes it fucking clutch. Oh, like, absolutely. you know what I mean? Yeah. I bet like when you're in the studio and he's like, this isn't working and you're like one second. And you throw that line in there, that's that would be clutch to be yeah. able to do yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I was just going to like bring up Googling, you know, not Googling lyrics, but Googling ideas for lyrics and stuff like that. Meaning, like, if you have a song idea, um, but you don't know much about it, like, there's a there's a, a song called Butcher of San Antone that I was like, is there, is there a thing like about that? Like, because I had the idea. And so I looked it up, and there was an actual story about. Uh, they called the butcher of New Orleans. So they were in New oh, Orleans. Wow. Yeah, and it was a, a, a this like uh, priest or a monk or some sort of like religious guy that was like going around murdering people, like Whoa. crazy. So yeah. I was like, okay, I'm gonna write the song about that. I had this, I had the idea, but I didn't know what to write about, you know. And so like I went and I looked up a story and I found a story that kind of like resembled something that I was I was working on. So like that's something that. That I don't normally do, for one. But mm. every now and again, there's a song that I'll, I'll I'll just like research. Have you ever done anything like that? Oh, constantly. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, constantly. Yeah, I like just the other day I went I deep dove on uh, Marty Robbins and all of his like uh, cowboy storyteller style country songs. Oh, cool. And uh, yeah, and that's I do that all the time. Yeah, I, well, I'm I'm a lyrics nerd. 
Like I, I ha I want to know, I want to feel like I'm close to that songwriter and what exactly what they were thinking instead of my own perception of it. So I, mm -hmm. I definitely do that all the time. And then that made me think in, in the same notepad in my phone, I have like, write a song about this, write a song about this. And like think about a concept, but sometimes they're just ridiculous. Like the other day I was trying to filter through stuff I didn't need in my notepad and my phone. And there's one that said, write a song about a failing steakhouse. I don't know what, <laughs> I don't know what mental state I was in at that point, but I was like, this is a great idea. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Love it. Well, it, you know, what's funny about that idea is, is um, YouTubers kind of do that. Like YouTubers, mm. I've watched, uh, or I listened to a, a podcast about a YouTuber and they were talking about like how they come up with their ideas and they just literally brainstorm video ideas and write them all down and, and they like come up with hundreds. I, I don't do that as a songwriter, but like, that's kind of what you're, what you're doing. Like, I guess if I do it, I don't do it consciously. Like I don't mm. sit around and go, okay, let's come up with some song titles and come up with some, but at some point, maybe there's other things like uh, when a band needs a new album title, it's like, isn't that, yeah, absolutely. sometimes it's easy, but sometimes it's the hardest thing you're like to decide yeah. on. Like, cause you might like an idea and then, your drummer is like, that's dumb or, or whatever, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, th with, uh, with the last full length that we did under tension, that was a line I wrote on my phone when I was stressed out. They had nothing to do with anything. And then that ended up becoming part of like the entire aesthetic for the album and like the whole concept, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I, I think I think it's just listening to the world around you. And I, I think a lot of us can get caught, songwriters and not songwriters, a lot of us can get caught in tunnel vision, you know, especially this day and age tunnel vision's right in our cell phone in front of us you know it's like we can kind of get caught in one thought process and uh your brain craves routine right so that routine can can keep us locked in and i think it's just really those notes and songwriters that write these great songs they're just paying attention a little more than a lot of us are and so that's why i try to stay up on you know i'm like trying to pay attention to the world around me and maybe a hundred of those notes are garbage and i'll never use them but 101 is the shit and it's the best song i've ever written you know so yeah. I think it's all, all about just like, you know, it's all a ride, right? Like that's what Bill Hicks used to say. It's just a ride. So yeah. I'm, just, I'm just trying to pay attention. <laughs> well, if you've thought about like hit songs and what makes a hit song and all that, but like you can't have 10 songs in a row all hits because something yeah. will rise above all those other hit songs, right? Like Absolutely. It's just weird because how many times have you, been, you thought about it as a songwriter? You're like, okay, I'm just going to you – know, I'll write a bunch of songs, but I'm only going to pick – the hit songs, but like, it doesn't flow as well when it's like that. Like, you know, the, nah. what makes certain songs so much more popular with the, the audience and like, it could be a lot of different things, you know, but it's just yeah. a weird. I don't even know what I'm trying to say, but just, it's a weird <laughs> phenomenon that you can't really have 10 hit songs in a row. <laughs> no, but, no. And it's that, it's that concept though, that once you play a song for someone else, it's not yours anymore. Right. So mm -hmm. they're going to make what they want out of it. So how the hell are we supposed to know what the mass populace is going to hear from what we wrote, you know? And yeah. I feel like every time I write a song, I feel like the one that I think is like the one is a buried track on the record. No one ever hears, you know? So true. Someone about, else yeah. I mean, <laughs> why is that? I don't know. I hate it. It's the <laughs> worst. I feel like someone else has to go like, no, this is the hit. And more I, often than not, it's the one that I'm like, what? I thought I was phoning that one in. What are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, you have to simultaneously try and not try at the same time. Like, just there's just some <laughs> weird combination of like, if you try too hard, it's no good. If you don't try hard enough, you know, you don't pay attention to it enough, you know, and so things get missed. But I don't know. There's that. There's that balance in there. For sure, but that's all part of the process, right? And that's the beauty of it. And like, not to bring it totally back, but vulnerability. It's like. In that unknown space, there is where you truly find what art is. It's it's a vulnerable person writing something vulnerable. So I think it all yeah. makes sense. Yeah, no, it absolutely does. And and everything really, you know, the more I think about just the process of what we do, can be done by any creative type of person. You know, it doesn't just have to be songwriting, being in a band, but yeah, you know, it's what we know definitely. Yeah. I mean, Every, absolutely. At this point, I don't really know much else, you know, like not not trying to tout that, but it's like after 25 years and you obviously a lot longer than me, it's like, you know, it's the only thing I really know about. So it's like, 
you know, and it's obviously still important to me too, which I think that is part of the struggle of what we do is, or any creative is keeping your art in the forefront, your, for as far as you want to take it, you know, because obviously life throws so much at you. It's tough to uh, constantly focus on it, but I mean, man, if you can keep doing it and, you know, especially as long as you have, as long as I have, it's, it's a blessing, man. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's important to, to just sit back and, and realize that, that not everybody gets to do what we get to do. So <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Dude. <laughs> oh man. I got to check one second. It's recording, but I got to check the power thing. Yeah. No worries. It got kind of semi unplugged, and so it wasn't actually. I could see that the the thing was turning. I'm glad you checked that because I listened to your episode, your last episode with Chris Rowe, and you were talking about <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about the lost episode. I, I don't want to be that next mm. lost episode. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely not. This I have a backup recording of this though. Just so. oh, nice. All right, all right. All right. But that one was in. We were in Europe. We were in the Netherlands, and. uh in, in the basement of the venue. So, yeah, no backups there. Just just a, <laughs> yeah. a recorder. Man, I mean, that's the thing. Talking about taking things for granted or, or not taking things for granted, that what we're talking about, like being grateful. And that's another thing, just being able to travel. And, and, and no, no matter how successful or unsuccessful certain musicians may be, you know, in their careers, but we all have this in common. We get to travel the world. And, you know, some get to different places, you know, of course, but like just the fact that you guys have been traveling the world doing what you do in a street punk band. That's amazing. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. You know, when we went to Japan, that was all too real. Yeah. It was like, you know, um, obviously going to Europe is incredible and I love it. We're going back in August. Um, I, I love it to death, but going to Japan was a different, it was a different situation where all of a sudden I was like, Oh wow, we, we do really do this. This is what we do. And uh, you know, to have people over there who can't, speak English barely at all, know all your lyrics and, you know, want you to sign their records. It's so cool. And it's so horribly humbling. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, like all of us, like, you know, you, you, you just start to like, you start to think at your life, you like, you look at your life very lin linearly and you're like, Oh, I made it here. You know, I'm, I'm very proud to have made it here. But Japan was crazy. That was the big one for me. It was, it was crazy to be there and to play our music. And like you said, in a street punk band too, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. like have, have people come out. It was really, really cool to, uh, to be able to do that and see like, also like the first thing we did when we got there was go to record stores and like, look for like Japan only releases and I just got reminded that there are record collectors and music lovers all over the world just like us, you know. And it was, yeah, it was real beautiful and surreal. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It, it is cool to see that the world is such a big place but such a small place and that music does, you know, go past those barriers, those lines, those boundaries. And, you know, I just, about t maybe eight years ago, I started just looking around anytime I was – anywhere even in the u.s when we go to new york or we go to any any city that's not something i'm normally in yeah. um, I, I feel like okay this could be the last time maybe it's because something happens with the band but maybe it's because the world blows up i don't know you know yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. so you just never know and and at that time like um it was like 2014 we were doing a tour in europe and it was uh the the paris uh the paris Bucket Lawn Theater. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but mm -hmm. that shooting happened, uh, and we were in Lithuania at the time. So we were just, you know, short, short, you know, bit away, and that was just insane. You know, ever since really then, I've really been like this. I may never come back to wherever I am. You know, you just never yeah. know. like it's all. You know, it might be some some new thing, and of course, COVID and all that, but. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so just like go out there and just love life. And, and the reason I wanted to mention that is because I toured so many years. And yeah, we saw things along the way, but I got to the point where I was like, I don't need to go out and, and, and go out into the town and see the town square. I'm just, I'm fine sitting on the bus or sitting in the venue or <laughs> sitting yeah, at the yeah. bar next door or whatever. And, and, I, and I kind of flipped myself back to any chance I get. If somebody's going out to go see something that's worth seeing in town, I'm gonna go with them, and and I and I went out and and did that, and I've tr still been doing that, 
Um, but I think I needed that reminder again because, like, mm -hmm. you get so busy. Uh, we just did some shows in April, and they're uh, it's still April, but <laughs> we just did some shows <laughs> at the beginning of April, and it was great. Yeah. But I feel like, oh my gosh, the the um, it was just so busy. There was so much going on. That yeah. I need to stop and and really just enjoy it. Yeah, it's all about learning to take that breath, you know, and realize that you're there, and uh, you know, and that when I say that, that could even be at your house with your family. You know what I mean? It's like in life in general, not to get too deep with it, but that's, that's a huge point that we all get like sucked into, right? Is like, we get caught in our routine. We get caught in our daily life and we forget that like, it's a fucking blessing that we're here on this planet right now, you know? And then let alone at this time too, like, what, you know, if you look at history, what an incredible time for us to still be alive even with how dark things seem at you know at most times but uh, i was gonna add about japan real quick we got caught in two natural disasters on that tour so it was at the end of 2019 and we were in tokyo and there was a a um there was a tsunami and an earthquake at the same time and we got evacuated yeah and we got yeah. it we got evacuated into a middle school that had been converted into a shelter um and that's where we ended up sleeping that night and we had to we had to run like two miles in 200 mile an hour winds, like crazy stuff to where like the locals who we were staying with were telling us to like watch out for bicycles. Cause sometimes the wind will pick up a bike and like throw it. Yes. Like, and it was really scary. And this is such a weird thought, but in that moment I was like, well, I'm going to go, this is a pretty awesome way to go. Right. I got to tour the world and this is how I go out, you know? And like, I think it's a, that's a, it was such a weird concept for me to think about at that time, but I was like, man, life is pretty great. You know, like yes. I have done a lot and like the, the fact that I'm in this scary situation is somehow also pretty rad. Yeah. That's amazing <laughs> that you say that. Cause that reminds me, I was in Australia at the time that that happened and my parents love Japan. They love Japan because my dad used to go there for work. And so my mom would go and visit him. And then she like became friends with like some of the mm -hmm. dynamics PX you know, friends, friends of ours. And they were there when that happened. They were visiting Kyoto. Uh, and, you know, oh, there's wow. that giant, there's a giant monk temple or Buddhist temple and all that. But anyway, like, yeah. they got stuck for like four or five hours, like just in town waiting for the trains to restart. So they weren't wow. ne necessarily like right near the thing, but they were still affected by it. It was pretty insane. Yeah, it, it was nuts. Yeah, the, the the river next to where we were staying had flooded, and that was the big problem as to why we had to get out of there. Um, and we had to cancel. We were supposed to go to Okinawa for the last few days of our tour, and we had to cancel that. And we immediately had to get flights because the thing is, we we had to cancel the last two days, and then we had to we were scrambling to get flights because we also had prior obligations to get back home and fly to San Francisco to play um, on a aircraft carrier with Cox Bar. So this like huge show yeah. in like the middle of the San Francisco like harbor, you know, like and we we were like shit, we can't miss this. This is like going to be one of the greatest shows of our lives, which it was. But that it like you said, uh, it was such a blur at that time. Like you know, we were rushing around and there was a natural disaster, and then I'm in this shelter, and then I'm scrambling for flights, and then I'm on a plane, and then I'm in San Francisco playing on an aircraft carrier, you know. And that that alone, to think about that experience, like that's so beautiful that I even got to do any of that is so rad, man. I, I think that's why, you know, musicians just have a different mindset when they've traveled so much because you get to do so much in such a compressed amount of time. Yeah. And, and when I look back on all the things we've done, it's always been kind of like what you're saying, like what it's just mm -hmm. like rush, 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 rush. <laughs> all right, fine. Okay, you know, like, all right, we missed our flight. All our luggage is gone, but we're still at the gig in Portugal, and we're gonna go. We missed our set time, so we're going on after the Foo Fighters. We have no. We're borrowing these guitars that aren't our. You know, like things like that. It's like you just have to go on instinct. You know. Yeah. And and it's not for everybody, but I think humans have a weird way of adapting. Like you just, if you have to keep going, you keep going. Yeah. You know. And Absolutely. Then, yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I grew up, my dad was in the army and, uh, we traveled all over the world. So it's always just kind of been there for me. Like, you know, my family's from here. My parents grew up in like, uh, Des Moines and Federal Way and my grandparents live in Enumclaw where my parents live now. Um, but I, it's that transient lifestyle was just a part of who I was from the very beginning. We lived in Germany. I did an exchange program to Russia at a very young age. Like it's just always kind of been there. So I don't really know it. I don't really know anything else. 
at this point. I don't know how I could stop because I know that like when success took a big break and I was stagnant for a while, I freaked out. I was like, oh, I got to get on the road. I have to do something. You know, as much as I can be creative, I have to keep going. And I think I think if you stay on the road long enough, like you said, you start to adapt and you start to go like, oh, I can survive anywhere at any time doing anything, you know? And there's there's a beauty to that, you know? There's something really cool to that. Yeah, there is, there is. And there's there's also <laughs> like... All right, th- this has gone too far. <laughs> I <laughs> yeah, can tell those well, stories too. But <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah, you can't paint it like it's all great for sure. And there have definitely there have definitely been times where I've been like, get me off this fucking tour right now. So. What's funny is like to, to like so you know uh, I don't know you know non touring folk you know people come. I thought it was so funny when our friends would come onto our bus and they'd look up and, or even just like fans, like and now and again, we'd let fans up to see the bus and they'd look at it and go, Oh my gosh, how do you guys live in here? It's so cramped. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, have you seen the van we used to tour? In? <laughs> yeah. Totally. This was like the lap of luxury for us. And, but it would be kind of like maybe somebody walking into a private jet and saying, this is tiny, you know? Well, yeah. Yeah. But but it's just mine. So see you later. <laughs> Bye. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I remember when success toured with melancholy, we toured melancholy twice. And uh, the first time we toured with them and I went on their bus, they were just like giving me booze. And uh, I was like, you bastards. I was like, this is beautiful. And they were like, Oh, it's kind of small. I was like, Oh dude, like, what are you? I was like, our van smells so terrible right now. that just the smell makes me want to be on your bus. But, uh, and then I ended up, guitar teching for them and i was i did tour with them which was really really great and you know you get accustomed to like that yeah. i don't know like, having I a bathroom like, <laughs> yeah exactly like yeah and even my little like it's just is such a dismal thing of being able to shut the curtain on my bunk is like now it's time for me to go to bed you know you can't do that in a van you can't do that in a hotel room you're sharing with you know four other people five other people and so that little that little bit of luxury was it was really nice. <laughs> it's a total different lifestyle, uh, bus living versus van living. Like you don't see mm. nearly, you know, har- hardly anything. You know, you could just you could just see the venue and a yeah. truck stop now and again, and nothing else, yeah. it, or a hotel maybe. But but like you're in a van, you see, you know, usually you're part of you know the driving crew. You know, if you guys rotate or whatever, but. You yep. just see so much and you do so much more and you go different places. It's just like you also don't sleep at all. So it's like, nope. <laughs> you know, nope. <laughs> yeah. so I mean, it's just, yeah, it's a lot harder for, for one. Yeah. I mean, we did warp tour the first two. Maybe it was just the first year, 97. That was our first year. And we did like mm. a couple weeks in the van and like we mm. would show up early in the morning and just sleep with the ac on you know or with the yeah. van running so that we wouldn't die of of because we were on the east coast during summer so it was bad yeah. but i mean it can be comfortable though like our van we used to have a love seat that wasn't mm. it wasn't tied down or attached to anything like free floating free floating <laughs> but it was heavy enough that it, it, it would only like float forward if you like jammed on the brakes really hard and <laughs> yeah. everything would fall forward like Whoa. totally totally legal totally, totally yeah legal. i mean this this was this was late 90s so probably yeah. mid to late 90s yeah so you know <laughs> we got away with it yeah that was also the I days should... where you would open up we would open up the sliding door and have like paintball guns or uh <laughs> what firecrackers and you know throw them at people <laughs> yeah Dude, I, I still love it, you know, like we're, we're, we're obviously like, you know, talking about how great the, the bus life is, but I still love the van. I love it to yeah. death, man. I don't want to do anything else. Looking out that windshield is some of the most serene moments I've ever had in my life, you know? Yeah. And my guys luckily still love it too. Our drummer was in Madcap. And so he, like he would, when he was doing work tour, they were also like hauling the barbecue. For I think two okay, years. Okay. Yeah. 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 So. Wow. So he was like, haul the barbecue, get up, make food for everybody, you know. And then like, it's that was an extra bit of work on top of it. So it's like, you know, you do what you got to do in those situations. And I, I love. I, I we can complain all day about it. I also wouldn't change anything. I fucking love touring in a van. So. I mean, you know, and it's funny because like, there's obviously levels of crazy work ethic, mm. and and you see people. You know, you go down in South America, it's insane. People working till they're, 
basically dead, you know, like really old mm. people just working harder than I've ever worked, you know, every day of their life, they're working harder than I ever worked probably one day. You know? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I started out, you know, sure, I've done landscaping, sure, I've done food <laughs> service, construction yeah. a little bit, you know, but like, that's nothing, you know, like, it's nothing really, especially because I didn't have to do it my whole life. I've been doing this grind, yeah. this, you know, driving vans, you know, I'd say I've probably driven more than most your average person, you know? Mm, yeah, same uh, here. Yeah. I my, love it. My longest drive is 37 hours straight without, oh. without sleeping, stopping for gas and getting food at the gas station and then yeah. keeping going. But it, we, we, we was, did 46, it but it was me and one, me and Jake. We did 46. Uh, that was coming home. We had, we were on the drowns were on tour with no fun at all. Mm, and uh, guys, yeah. we, such a great band. You know such all the kids. Swedes. <laughs> yeah, I, I, somehow. <laughs> Somehow I fell into that world, you know, yeah, like yeah. also like, and, and then they all started like, like I got that opportunity through Melon Colin and then I was a huge 2.8 fan and Frederick joined uh, no fun at all. So it's just like this little uh, Atlas losing grip. The bass player plays in no fun at all. Now it's like, yeah, I love all the Swedes. They're all great. So I, I actually haven't been there. I'd love to, to go there someday. Um, but yeah, the, the, I forget where I was going with that. The, <laughs> but, just your van you're talking about the van but yeah yeah i don't know yeah it's gone <laughs> oh you were talking about uh touring with uh with no fun at all oh yes thank you we drove back from ottawa mm -hmm. and uh to seattle and no shows just straight, straight. Yeah. yeah and it took it took 46 hours but we did it and it was just me and one other guy doing like 10 hour shifts basically that's a haul yeah well mine yeah. mine was um mine was just because I was like, I think I can just go. I was going from Dallas to San Francisco, me and my, my wife at the time. Uh, well, she's still my wife, but, <laughs> but at the time she was, but it was, it was her, it was me moving her out to Washington and we were mm. stopping in San Francisco. So we, we made it, I drove literally Dallas to San Francisco. It took me 37 hours wow. and, and I wasn't planning on doing it myself, but at one, well, at, it was in Flag Flagstaff, Arizona, at 4 a.m., and I'm just like hallucinating, going, ah, uh, and then I see a peak of light, and then it grows brighter, and, and I start waking up, and I'm like, I stop hallucinating, I'm like, I can do this, and so I kept going and <laughs> went all the way to San Francisco, got there that afternoon or whatever. <laughs> but that's literally not, it wasn't even on an MXPX tour. Yeah, but that was that, but MXPX prepared me for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you get into a zone, you know, yeah. like you get. It's almost like meditative. You get into this state to where it's just like you're just going, you know. Like it, it's it's easier for me to do that in places where there's not a whole lot, like uh, like Wyoming. I could like mm -hmm. drive straight. I love that state, but I could drive straight through that state just because it's all flat, you know. So back in yeah. those days, we used to listen to. People nowadays would probably listen to podcasts and, and things like that. We'd listen to music tons. We had the huge CD book, but we also listened yeah, to course. comedy shows. Dennis Leary, mm -hmm. Chris Rock. I mean, we would listen to these uh, Tenacious D. Um, maybe that's a little early, but maybe that was no, that was that was bus life. Um, anyway, my point is, is we we would get so ingrained, like we we knew all these jokes, like. Oh, yeah, we absolutely. Quote this shit constantly. Yeah, yeah, was there anything? Sure. Is there anything like that that you guys put on over and over just because it becomes something that's just bigger <laughs> than the actual thing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, now we could probably recite uh, "Werewolves and Lollipops," the Pat Oswald album, from like front to back because the band always throws that on. And you know, I think uh, I'm sure it happened with you guys too. It becomes little bits between you two to where yeah. it's like. There's a little bit of kinship where like something will happen and you'll throw a Chris Rock joke out that you all know, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And now, nowadays, like you said, it's all podcasts. And, and I think unless you do like the long haul drives, you don't realize how much music is incredible, but it will start to get old sooner or later. And you need something engaging and podcasts are really great for that. Um, it's an impromptu pitch for your podcast right now. But, there you go. There you <laughs> but, go. <laughs> yeah. uh, but we do, my band does a lot of true crime stuff. So that's that's okay. a big one for us. We're all true crime nerds. So we'll put on a couple really good true crime podcasts. And um, my guys also are all like, the big dorks. So anytime we can learn history podcasts and stuff like that, you know. Does it, it uh, get too, too crazy, the, the, the crime podcast? 
Uh, you're like, yeah, yes. uh, I can't hit like I gotta take a break. Yes, it yep. does. Yeah. Uh, like, well, so like the more kind of murder centric ones, yeah. But I like ones that are about like heists and stuff oh, like that. Oh, okay. So like, um, like how but, they uh, did it, how they planned it, like how they got uh, caught, like all of that. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, I absolutely love it. Yeah. The uh, and like just like long term criminal stories and stuff like that are always really interesting to me. Like someone gets stuck in that mindset for so long. But um, there are yeah, a couple of the guys in the band are definitely into like the murder centric podcast and that can it can get old <laughs> after a while you know yeah like we've we've listened to the same episode of this one podcast about the green river killer multiple times and my dad used to work with him at kenworth back in the day they weren't friends or anything but they both worked at kenworth and renton whoa and so like even listening to that one gary, i remember being like name, gary it, or is it yeah gary ridgeway yeah ridgeway yeah it was too close to home. So, like, after a while, I'm like, oh, I don't want to think about that stuff more. That's Granted, a lot of serial killers come from the Northwest, so it's hard to avoid. Why is that? <laughs> like, is it because of the gloominess of it? It's got to be, dude. I don't know. I don't know. The <laughs> rain. You, I mean, yeah, you would think New York, because New York's just seedy and dark. But at the same time, like, yeah, the Pacific Northwest is the only other place I can think of in the U.S. that has... I don't know, that dank feel to it. You know, I was uh, talking to somebody, a friend of mine who just moved here. Um, I was talking to him the other day about how during the winters and the falls, you learn to talk to yourself into being happy here. And that's a weird thing to say, and it sounds negative, but it's totally not. It's like when the gloom shows up and the gray shows up and you don't have that vitamin D, you know, like from the mm -hmm. sun, um, you, you find ways to keep yourself happy. And I think there's a real beauty to that. As much as we, you know, we were just talking about serial killers, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is the opposite. I think there's a real great part of where we come from, where it's like we've had to, just like you and I were talking about going on the road. You have to, like, create your routine that you get used to. And every year, you know, I can feel a shift to where I'm like, oh, I got to talk myself into being happy again for a little while because the sunshine's not going to do it for me. My buddy just moved here uh, forget where he came from last i think it was london but he's an irish dude he just moved to seattle and i was like yeah let me know if you need help i'll take you you know we'll go do we'll go play pinball or something during the fall during the winter let me know you know <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah that's interesting i mean yeah i mean i grew up there so i don't i don't even think about it too much but the awareness of knowing that if you are bummed that it's probably not your fault. It's like, that's the weather's fault. <laughs> you know, it's good to have a <laughs> yeah. scapegoat, right? Like, blame Absolutely, the weather. Yeah, something to blame it on, yeah. <laughs> but growing up, everybody from California would always say, oh, you're from Seattle? Oh, it always rains there. That's like the first thing they always say. And they still kind of say that, but I think it's, I think just with the internet, they realize that everywhere is a little, you know, kind of the same. Yeah. And it just, it, it changes, but nothing's super the consistent is, anymore, right? Everything's kind of haywire yeah. these days. Yeah, and it's also, well, yeah, it snowed here yesterday, randomly, for like an hour it snowed in Seattle, yeah. Yeah, that's insane. I'm in Texas <laughs> yeah. right now, so I didn't get to get to enjoy it, but. Oh, right. <laughs> but oh, it like, sounds terrible. It's like 80s here um, every day, um, but it did hail last week. It, it it hailed, and like it was insane for just like an hour, and then it went back. It's like, now we're in Florida, apparently, because yeah. Florida I, rains know. every day for like 20 minutes. Yeah, and that's the thing, right? So people think it, it rains so much here, but it's also like a smattering of rain. So, like, it'll be gray and it'll be a smattering. It's not like Chicago raindrops, you know, where it's, like, annihilating you, you know. Uh, my wife moved here from Boston, well, the Boston area, from Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And people, that's the first thing they would ask her when she moved here six years ago. They were like, hey, uh, like, you know, well, how are you doing with the rain? And she would always go, well, I don't have to fucking shovel rain. Because, you know, it snows over there so much. The winters were so hard that, like, I don't know. I think you're just getting used to it. I love it still. I, I couldn't see myself living anywhere else. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I could <laughs> 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 I could see myself living in a lot of places. But uh no, I still love Bremerton. <laughs> Bremerton is my bread and butter. It's my it's where I feel the most at home. It's where I feel yeah. and the Pacific Northwest in general. Like I, I get it. I get the the area. I can't get lost even if I don't know where yeah. I, I I am. Which was cool actually. Last last year I, I took a, a snow it was like a snow, not a snowmobile, but it was like a quad kind of thing. And mm -hmm. I got on the back with my buddy and it was his quad. And we went all over the place when it snowed crazy. It was like two, two feet deep snow everywhere, or maybe more. Yeah, yeah. And we went to places I had never been in Bremerton. 
But maybe it was because it was snowy, but we were going through neighborhoods, and I saw this like this like a bridge thing. I'm like, what is this? Like I've never seen this. <laughs> so maybe I can get lost in Bremerton. But <laughs> we we actually we just played the the Charleston like man not too long ago, and it had been a when? long time. Like this oh, man, year. We, yeah, yeah, we played there with Bridge City Centers. We did a, a small run with them earlier this year. Oh, oh yeah, I definitely missed it, but um. I'd love it to see fun. you guys. I, I've been seeing some shows locally, you know, in Bremerton here and there, and the, mm. and and more and more like outside, you know, touring bands are coming to Bremerton. Whether it's to the Charleston, um, yeah, Manette Saloon is another place, and then the the thir- the new place is it's bigger is um, Tracyton Movie House. So oh, cool, awesome. yeah, it's in East Bremerton, and um, uh, Teenage Bottle Rocket just played there. Oh, it was, rad. It was good. Cool. It was it was a good turnout. So anyway, but yeah, just come back. Come back and do it again. You know, I was trying to think of – earlier today, I was trying to think of the first time you and I met. And I'm pretty sure it was either Club Impact 20 years ago in Tacoma or it was at Rush's Bookstore. Wasn't that the name of the bookstore that used to put on shows in Bremerton? Oh, Rush Coffee House Books. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Rush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it is Rush's Coffee House. It had to be – Club Impact 20 years okay. ago because I don't remember going to any shows at Rush. <laughs> it was kind of during a time where we were always gone, like that, gotcha. that era of that place. And I and I knew about it, but it was – I'm sure I was – how old are you, Rev, if you don't mind? Uh, 38. So yeah, so you're so, – so you would have been like doing that scene, that all-ages scene where I was well over 21 at that point. Yeah. That's my that's my guess. That's my guess. Yeah, it was I, the only reason why I thought of that show was because it was with the St. Louis Smiles who became the Hollow Points, and I just I, I thought I, I remember, remember at that show. I but, I, no, yeah, I wasn't at that show. Yeah, what would have been would have been Club Impact then? Yeah, and I remember uh, the first the first time we played together was with Tumble Down and Success and Ninja Gun and Mike Hale, and that show oh, was yeah. incredible, man. I loved that lineup. Yeah, Ninja Gun <laughs> and Mike Hale. I remember that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's rad. Um, man, that show is so good. Does I love? I still love Mike. I still talk to him all the time. But Ninja Gun, man, that's a band that no one remembers. Mm-hmm. That was incredible. That that Agreed. one album they have with the peach on the front is like perfect. That's it's the one. So good. That just the it's first song. So on there. good. The first song you yeah. hit, and it's like, yeah, I like this. Like, I wish I would have wrote that song. That's cool. You know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're so good, man. <laughs> that's cool. I'm. That's that's cool to get reminded of that. Yeah, that was fun. Tumble down. Um, that was a fun era because it was like we were – well, we were starting over, opening yeah. for tons of you know uh, touring acts that would come through, doing our own little little mini runs here and there. We never made it to the East Coast. We, we got as far as like Chicago and, and south, you know, down to Texas and all that. We never quite made it further past that, and I know we would have, but it was just like mm. we were literally kind of funding our own stuff. And so yeah. we did – the first coast was West Coast. You know, the next tour was like into Salt Lake City. It was like I was kind of like without being too strategic about it. I was kind of trying to be strategic of just coming back to those places and then working my way east. That makes sense. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was it was a good time. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I, man, that that show was I, I remember Mike killed it that night. He was amazing. But Ninja Gun, man, that band was so good. Uh, I'm going to have to pull that record out now. Yeah, yeah, I remember hanging out with those guys uh, backstage, talking to them, probably talking about that song or that record. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's got a cool sound to it. I remember like the way it was mixed, like the sound of the guitar, the acoustic guitar yeah. was like, oh, okay, that's different. That's cool. I liked it, but it was different than, than say the the way the the t- tumble down recordings sounded. You know, the acoustic guitar on it. So yeah, well, I think the singer's name was like Cootie or something. Yeah, Cootie. Yeah. Yeah, and he, he I remember like his he has a very uh like to bring him back to songwriting real quick, he has a very like uh paint a picture of a period kind of songwriting. Like that song he has about I- I'm assuming it's his parents, but uh the arguing couple who will always love each other even though they bicker all the time. There's a uh it's called Front Yard Screamers, I think is the name of the song. Kitchen Kissers is like the, the chorus line. But he had this he has this really great way of songwriting of painting a picture in your head. It's almost like watching a movie scene, which I wish I could do, but I definitely definitely can't do that. <laughs> yeah, he he's he's does it really well. I agree. I agree. <laughs> Man, I mean, so so 
with the drowns, do you guys uh, what do you guys got coming up? We'll uh, we got to wrap it up in a minute, but uh, what's uh, what's happening? Do you have shows? Are you going to do any shows coming up or just yeah? Just so they're, keeping they're, out records. Yeah, that too. There there will be an, 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 until someone stops me. Uh, there will be an announcement uh, of some tour dates coming up soon. But in June, we'll be going from here to Texas and back. Um, and yeah, and then uh, in July and August, we're in Europe. Bunch of festivals, bunch of great dates. Uh, ending at Rebellion and uh, then flying home. And probably more dates to come after that. I would assume probably you know is, U.S. states. Rebellion is the perfect festival for you guys. You're gonna love. It. Have you played it? Have you been? Yeah, yeah we have. Yeah, yeah cool. it's it's my favorite festival in the world, man. <laughs> That's yeah. It's just all the oys, everybody. Yeah, <laughs> all yeah. the punkers. And and yeah, surprisingly it, enough, like MXPX played, and I was like, are people gonna like hate us because we're not oi? Or that? it was so much fun, man. Like we had such a yeah. good time. And Everybody who runs it too is like so nice. And that's where I got to see Cox Bar. Oh, nice. Yeah. Hell yeah. And yeah. I think uh, Stiff Little Fingers, in fact. So rad. We're, we're playing. We're on the same day as them this year. So I'm really hoping that I get to scoot out at the right time and go see them again. Right on. Uh, yeah, and then we got uh, our new, uh, we got a 12-inch, the six-song 12-inch EP that's coming out uh, on May 6th called lunatics that we just dropped two singles for live like you're dying we dropped a video for and the song lunatics just came out the other day uh, which is about the homeless epidemic here in seattle and um how how bad it's gotten and how uh the homeless are treated in the u.s right now and how we feel about that so we've got a new music video coming out that addresses that too so hopefully you know hopefully it'll hit people well awesome. but the entire ep is really good it's called lunatics i'm uh I'm really proud of it. It's and it's got some of those songs we just talked about where Ted Ted laid into me, the producer laid into me on those. So <laughs> so they're, they're pretty good. <laughs> good, dude. I can't wait to hear it. May six. All right, we'll put it up on the notes and all that. Where can people find awesome. you online? Pirates Press Records. Okay. I mean, if you look for the drowns anywhere, but Pirates Press Records is where to get any merchandise, any records, and any news on us. They're real great about keeping everybody updated. So awesome. And people want to check out your band. It's just the drowns, or is it? What on yep. on all the socials, all that? Yeah, except Twitter, it's We Are The Drowns. Okay. For some reason, there was already a Drowns on Twitter. So. <laughs> Isn't there always? Isn't there always? Yeah. <laughs> and, of course, Aaron Rev. What is it? Aaron Rev on Instagram? Yep. yep, you got it. Yeah. Cool, cool. Awesome. Dude, thank you so much, man. It's been, it's been fun. <laughs> yeah, it's good to see you, man. Yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> good to catch up and talk some, some trash about touring and, <laughs> and songwriting. I love it. All right, let's play pinball soon. Absolutely, dude. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll, I'll be back this summer. We'll we'll do it up. Sounds good, man. <laughs> All right, cheers. <laughs> All right, thanks, man.